got some of that one? Good morning. Good morning. It's almost 10.30, isn't it? It's 10.31, actually. Oh, okay. Good to see everybody here. Uh, we have a sermonette this morning. He'll be with us in a few moments. We do not have singing this morning because our, our very illustrious professional singers are on vacation, and they're out of the area today. So I wish them a good time and some relaxation. And uh, but be with us next week because they'll be back next week. That's a prophecy. <laughs> Prophesy they're going to come back next week. Um, let's ask God's blessing. And we're going to get started today. Eternal God, I ask you and with all of our folks here, those watching online, that you will anoint this service and the messages that are going to be given today because it's very, very important that we learn these things if we are in the last days. Bless us, eternal God. Open up our hearts and minds to understand these very important things. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Before the sermonette, I'm going to tell you we have, uh, I will not go into the news or anything like that. I'm not going to do that. But suffice to say, because you're all watching the news anyway, you don't want to come to church and hear a lot of stuff about the news. But uh, some of the things I'm going to be talking about goes along with biblical prophecy. And so I want you to pay close attention. The message I am going to give you today could be one of the most important you'll hear all year. And I don't know what the sermonette's about today. That may be too. So, because a lot of times God inspires the sermonette and the sermon together. So pay close attention today because of what you're going to hear. It, it could be a matter of life and death if, if we are in the last days. I'm not setting dates, but if we are, we've got some important things to share with you today. Without further ado, I'd like to present to you, I don't need to introduce him because you already know him, but the man who's uh, received his doctorate here at Ambassador Christian College some years ago, and uh, he's going to be giving a, a sermonette today, and I don't know what his topic is. I never tell him what to preach. I ask him to pray, ask God to give him the message, so let's hear what he's got to say. Dr. Christopher Burse. Thank you, Dr. Sloan. Uh, good morning. Good morning and welcome to another Sabbath service. Uh, now, for our past three weeks, uh, you've heard Dr. Slough teach on how to have the faith of God. Uh, and you've also heard me speak on taking the next steps in your discipleship and not to be content with just the idea of being saved or being wherever you are in your current walk. Go a step further. Try and go a step further every day, right? So I want to tie all those things into what I'm going to speak on today. Now, many of you, when you hear this, you may think that I'm being overly critical. But I'm just going to ask that you, you just please bear with me and, and listen to where I'm going with all of this. Now, oftentimes, when we hear preachers pray from the pulpit, or even publicly, they don't have to be in the pulpit, you will hear the words Father, Father God, and Lord repeated every five or six words. Now, for me personally, it's always been kind of distracting to hear that uh, because it's like we, we know who we're praying to, right? Right? Um, but it's gotten to the point where with some folks, when I hear them doing this, it's like I can sit there and count every word, every time that they reference uh, God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, excepting the beginning and the end of the prayer, which they should always should always carry those references, and and I've counted into the twenties, even the thirties, with some of these folks as they're praying. And so again, again, 
being kind of critical here. What are you doing, right? So what am I talking about? Um, and then this is just a for example type of situation. I mean, if, if there was an improvised prayer by one of these folks, modern day preacher, let's call them, uh, and, and they hit upon the Lord's Prayer, it might sound something like this, and please forgive me for this. Um, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Lord. Let thy kingdom come, Father. Let thy will be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven, Father. And Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, Lord, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Father, lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from evil. Father, your, for yours is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Okay? So you kind of get what I'm talking about there. Where people are like inserting it all the time, time and time again. So some of you might even have a problem with that rendition. You might be like, where are you going with this? What is wrong with you? But for me, this is this is kind of terrible for a few reasons. Now, first of all, I'll say this because we're made in the image and likeness of God. Now, when we converse with one another, with our friends, our family, do, do we do that? Using a person's name over and over and over again? We, we don't. Come on, we don't. And if we did, our friends and our family members, and not to mention people we just met, would think we are out of our mind doing that. They would say, something is wrong with that verse. Okay? So why should we speak to God this way? I mean, the, the hymn says, what a friend we have in Jesus. And Jesus says, if you have the Son, you have the Father. So we have a friend in God the Father. Why should we speak to him that way? We don't speak to our friends on earth this way. Why should we speak to our Heavenly Father in, life, in that manner? Where we have to use his name every couple of sentences if he's going to lose attention from what we're talking about. And again, some of you are going to go, wow, that's, you're, you're just being overcritical, you're nitpicking, stop. But consider that if we use the, the New Testament way of of speaking, especially like in the Pauline epistles and that, when we say God and we say Father, we are referring to God the Father. When we say Lord, we're referring to Jesus Christ. And we know for a fact that the Son and the Father are not the same person. Okay? So let's, we're going to go ahead and we're going to tie this into Scripture now. Moses has been commentary up to now. Now let's tie this into Scripture. So in James chapter 4, he tells us that we do not have because we do not ask. And that we do not receive because we ask amiss. I've <clears throat> heard that before. So now when we pray with that above mentioned manner, using God's name every five or six words, are we not asking amiss? We are, but not for the reason that's stated in James chapter 4, but for another reason entirely. And that reason can be found in John chapter 16, verse 23. You just write that down, John 16, 23. I'll tell you what it says. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he is speaking that after the resurrection, the time after the resurrection, he says, And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Okay, that's a word from Christ. Amen? Okay. So, whom are you supposed to be asking? Father. Yet, how many of us, if we see an accident on the side of the road or watch an ambulance or fire truck go by, we say, Lord, please keep them safe. I do that. Do it all the time. I do it all the time. Here do, it, right the do, it, do it all the time. And in reality, what I should be saying his heavenly Father, keep them safe in Jesus' name. Because Jesus said, you will ask me nothing. Okay? Big difference there. And I'm guilty of that. So, I, like, uh, in the book of James, it says, you know, when you're teaching others, are you not teaching yourself? Absolutely I am. I mean, I, this is something I learned to want to share, right? Mm -hmm. So, that's what I should be praying. And that's what I have to retrain myself to pray. And so, why do I need to pray that way instead of a simple word, keep them safe? 
because like we saw in John 16, 23, that's what Jesus asked us to do. He said, this is what you will do. You know, actually it's not an ask, it's a command. In that day, you will ask me nothing. That's not it's really not an ask, that's a command. Ask the Father. So we're calling him Lord. Are we gonna do what he says? Okay. Again, we run right back into that. You're gonna call me Lord, but are you gonna do what I tell you? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do the things I say? So we wanna make sure that as we're calling him Lord, we're going to do what he says increase your discipleship, make it a little bit better, take another step, right? Now, the reason most of us pray this way, the wrong way, we were just discussing, can be summed up in one word, and that word is tradition. Because we hear everybody else do it. We hear the preacher in the pulpit do it, the, the people before them did it, that, you know, that's the, the way the guy did it before him, and the way the guy did it after him, and, you know, it, it's just the way it is, right? But now, Go into Mark chapter 7 and study that. Read Mark chapter 7 and you're going to see where Jesus speaks on laying aside the commandment of God in order to keep tradition. Now, he gives us a command on how to pray. If we lay that aside, should we be surprised if prayer does not get answered in a timely manner or at all? Are we not being a little bit double-minded where we're, we we want Christ, but we want to keep our tradition? And what does James say about being double-minded? You shouldn't expect anything from God if you're like that. Okay? We should all desire to please God. And we're always going to please Him when we're obedient to His Word. So many times, whether it's in Judaism, whether it's in Christianity, whether Roman Catholic, Protestant, or any of the fringe groups uh, that mainstream would consider fringe that are still identify themselves as Christian, they stumble when they keep their own tradition instead of the Word of God. So um, I just encourage you, this obviously this is going to be on Facebook Live, I encourage you to go back and study these things. If you didn't get a chance to write those down, listen to it again, write some of these scriptures down, study them, and pray on it. Because as you cast aside the tradition, start keeping the word of God and being obedient to what he tells you to do, you are going to see prayer answered when you cast aside the traditions. And so I just urge, urge you all to do that and uh, to be blessed as we go forward and until we meet again. Uh, may God bless all of you. Thank you very much. Amen. I came in on the tail end of this, but I'm <laughs> assuming that the bottom line is, if you love me, prove it. Yeah, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, you've heard of that, uh, you've heard of the five love languages, right? I think God's primary love language is acts of service. Do what he says. Be obedient. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Good to see everybody again. Welcome to our internet audience. What I'm going to share with you today is something that's very, very pertinent for this spring and this summer uh, as I'm doing this in the year 2022. Maybe this will be seen four or five years from now. I hope it will be because I hope we'll still be around at that time. Listen to this statement here. I'm not... You don't come to church to get scared. And I'm going to encourage you. I don't want you to get scared. I want you to go home encouraged. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to give you a whole list of what's happening in the news. I'm not going to do that. But let me just read you one short statement. Just one. This comes, this is printed, this, this came out last Saturday from the Express. Quote, the Sergeyev, can't pronounce Russian name, Serge, Sergey. Lavrov, however you want to say that in Russian, told a Russian audience, and here's the quotation. This came out last Saturday. The collective West, and that includes the United States of America, the collective West has declared total hybrid war on us. You remember what I told you last Saturday, how that we are provoking Russia. The collective West has declared total hybrid war on us, and it is hard to predict how long all this will last, but it is clear the consequences will be felt by everyone without exception. 
We did everything, we, the Russians, did everything to avoid a direct clash, but now that the challenge has been thrown down, we, of course, accept it. End of quotation. Did you hear what he just said? No, can you repeat that? All right, listen very carefully. This is very, very important. The collective West has declared a total hybrid war on us. And I told you last week, America is provoking Russia to war. Mm -hmm. Hybrid means it's, it's not just a Cold War. It's not just an Internet or, whatever they call it, uh, what's the word? Inform what is it? Well, maybe ways in uh, information war, like, uh, you know, on the, over the Internet. Just, you know, taking out internet. Yeah, internet war and all that stuff. Uh, Supply chains, economics. Yeah, all of that. Everything that you don't have to, you don't have to shoot guns to, to engage in war. You know, yeah, and then they're hacking and doing everything else. But also, we're looking at the possibility of a hot war. We're looking at that. Now, I'm not here to scare you. I just want you to be aware. I want you to be aware because you know you can say I'm not going to listen to this, and you could be like the proverbial ostrich. Bury your head in the sand and act like it doesn't even exist. There is no country such as Russia. We don't have anything to worry about. And by the way, for those of you who are watching over the Internet, and you say, man, I feel sorry for you folks living out there on the East Coast because you'll get it first. If, they, if Russia launches rockets against you, you'll get it first. Uh-uh. I've got a globe right over there I should have brought up here. Do you know where Russia actually is located? It's behind us. You ever looked at a globe? We think Russia is east of us, but if Russia launches rockets, they launch them over the North Pole. Because if Russia is here, America is here on the globe. So Russia would launch rockets over the North Pole, which means they could land in California, Kansas, anywhere. Unless they have some kind of deal with Cuba. Yeah. Now yeah, maybe Cuba wouldn't want them to launch too close to Florida. You never know. But let me, you said you wanted me to read this. Let me read it one more time. The collective West has declared total hybrid war on us, and it is hard to predict how long all this will last, but it is clear. The consequences will be felt by everyone without exception. Now, I will give you one exception. Our Congress will be protected. They have bunkers they can go to. None of them will die. See, we should have all run for Congress. We'd be all right. Because if you're a senator, if you're in the House of Representatives, what have they got a place where they can go underground? I have been on the Underground Railroad up in the Capitol. They have an underground railroad that you can ride from the Capitol building up to the House of Representatives. I went there to see our senator at the time, Jesse Helms. And uh, so they, and I don't know what all other places they got that the public's not allowed to find out about, but they're going to be fine. But you and I will suffer the, 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 um, the brunt. We, we will, we will have the consequences. So our leaders who make the war will be fine. It's you and me that's going to suffer. Now, that's not to scare you. That's not, not my, I'm not fear-mongering here. What I am trying to do is get you to think about what you can do to get God's protection during this time. Now, before you say, oh, I know what you're going to say. The Bible says if we're Philadelphians, we will escape the tribulation. Hold on. If Russia should launch, if they should retaliate against America, I mean, uh, what was his name? Uh, Lindsey Graham, I heard him say this a week or two weeks ago. He said, we're going to take out Putin. Those are fighting words. Now, here's the thing. If Russia should retaliate and launch an attack against the United States, that will not be the Great Tribulation. No. Great Tribulation comes after they rebuild the temple. Now, the Jews have now said, we are ready now to rebuild the temple. They hadn't started yet, but they're ready. And so what the, a Russian war, a war between the United States and Russia, and probably China might get into it, and NATO, and it might end up being a world war, but that still wouldn't be the Great Tribulation. Because, but, but here's what I started to say. That could precipitate the building of the temple. They may get so afraid, they're going to say, hey, we got to, we got to have God on our side. We better get this temple built. If you've ever read the book of Haggai, God says, why are you living in your own sealed houses? Where's your house that you're supposed to build for me? The Jews are reading that, the, the religious Jews in Israel. And they know they've got to build that temple. And this might build, I don't, I'm not a prophet. I'm not predicting how it will come. But I can tell you the Bible says there will be a rebuilt temple. And it's after that that the world's greatest tribulation will come. Now, if you brought your Bibles today, I want to give you actually a message of encouragement. I'm not going to turn to all these scriptures. There may be a few. Well, if you got your Bible, you may want to turn with me to Revelation because I'm going to be reading a few scriptures to you from Revelation. 
But it's probably not what you think. It's not about what's going to happen and all the horrible things. It's something different. We're told, Jesus told the disciples, your names are written in the book of life. That's in Luke 10, 20. If you're taking notes, you can jot these notes down, read them later. Luke 10, 20. Your names are written in the book of life. But then to these people whose names are in the book of life, and by the way, that's everybody in this room. Your names, if you're converted, your name is in that book. And every one of you watching online, over Facebook or over the over YouTube, your name is in, is in the book of life. If you're saved, if you're converted, if you've been begotten by God's Holy Spirit. And yet to these people, to us here in this room today, he says in Luke 21, 36, but you need to watch and pray that you may be accounted worthy. He didn't say you're worthy. He says, watch and pray that you may. I remember, and I've told you this a couple of years ago, I think, I heard John Hagee get up and give a... I used to listen to him quite often. I heard him give a sermon that the tribulation was coming, and he said, and you need to prepare, you need to get ready. Boy, that, boy I mean, I listened, I wanted to hear what he was going to tell these Christians. And all he did was give an altar call to the sinners and say, you need to get saved. Well, that's the first step. But what about all the Christians? Didn't say one word to them. So the implication is that if you're saved, you're automatically prepared. Uh-uh. If you're saved, your name's in the book of life. But if your name's in the book of life, Jesus says to you, you better watch, you better be, you better be praying always, so that as a result of your being in constant communion with God, praying always, that you may be accounted worthy. Now, if I were to ask you if you know for a fact that you're worthy, don't say, yes, I'm saved. I didn't ask you if you're saved. But I'm not going to ask you if you're worthy because you really don't know, probably. And I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I'm working on it. Now, the Philadelphians are pr promised protection during the tribulation. But what about these things that happened before the tribulation? Way back in the 40s, there were missionaries from America that went to China. And they told the Chinese they knew that there was a threat of a, of a communist revolution from Al Sutan. The missionaries told the Chinese, don't you worry at all about it. We'll be out here before anything like that happens. 1949, Mao Zedong came in there. He came and he took over China and killed and killed and killed Christians left and right. They said, oh, well, we'll be raptured before that happens. They were wrong. And for those of you watching on the YouTube and you say, oh, well, we won't be when that happens. You better wake up and smell the roses or wake up and smell the coffee. It ain't going to be that way. Because you see, even before the tribulation, a year or two years from now, we could all be dead in this room. That's not to, to, to give you fear. It's to be realistic. Don't be an ostrich. You've got more than bird brains. Use the God-given mind God gave you. Listen to me. Listen to what God says. We could all be dead a year or two years from now. And even if they don't drop a bomb where we are, the fallout alone, the radiation could cause you to die of very, very painful sickness. Oh, but God won't let that happen. Listen. America has killed over 60 million children legally. And the thing that really made God mad, if you read the Old Testament, I've studied it, is when they shed innocent blood. Now, every Christian has challenges. Everybody in this room, you, I don't know what they are, but you, you know what they are. Maybe your challenge is you sleep too late, you eat too much. Maybe you don't get enough exercise, and you're trying to be a perfect Christian, and you're still struggling. Maybe you're having trouble with your temper or something. That's one thing. But when you shed innocent blood, that's deliberate. That's not the same thing as having a car accident and somebody gets killed, and that'd be a tragic thing, but it'd be an accident. When a woman goes to an abortionist and says, kill my child, and over 60 million infants have been murdered, and we've got a president now who says, let's do it all the way up to the ninth month. And they knew that when they voted for him. So all the tens of millions of people who voted for pro-abortion stand under the judgment of God and is going to be punished. And here's the sad thing about it. When God allowed his own chosen people to be taken into captivity, even the righteous ones among them went into captivity. Daniel was a righteous man, but he was taken as a slave to Babylon. Now, God blessed him while he, after he got over there, but he still went through a lot of hardships that we don't know about. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were certainly very righteous men, but they were taken as captives. You and I, if we survive 
what will happen in the future could be taken as captives. But what I want to share with you today is that you can, even before the Great Tribulation, come under the protection of God. Would you like to know how? Okay. Be in communion with God. Pray always. Now, have you found Revelation? All right. This scripture here is used by, in many altar calls, and there's nothing wrong with it, by the way, uh, to try to reach the lost. Absolutely nothing wrong with this. But in chapter 3 of Revelation is a verse that if you grew up in church, you've heard this over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And it's given uh, at the time when, when they give invitations for the sinner to receive Christ. Verse 20, Revelation 3, 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, and as many preachers have explained this, or opening the door to their heart, I will come in to him and will sup. That's the old word for supper. I will dine with him and he with me. Now, theologians have a word that we don't hear out on the street all the time called exegesis. Exegesis means look at the text and see what it actually says. You'll notice this is in red letters. Jesus is talking. But if you look at verse 22, he that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you know that statement is given to all these seven churches? In chapter 2, verse verse. Uh, for example, verse 11, at the end of the letter to that church, he says that over and over and over. Look at uh, in chapter 2, verse 29, the last statement that Jesus gives Thyatira, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you know who Jesus is talking to? Yes, it applies to the sinner, but he's not talking to the heathen and the unconverted. He's talking to the saved. He's talking to those of us that are in God's church. Let me explain what that is. That's not a denomination. Every converted believer, at the sound of my voice, you're in God's church. You may not be in my church, or his church, or her church, or somebody. But if you're converted, God puts you in his church. God has one church. Every born-again, saved believer is in God's church, whether you belong to a denomination down here or not. You're in God's church. So here's the thing. To God's own church, and I believe that's every one of us here in this room, and many of you watching over the YouTube, he says to us, I'm standing outside knocking, let me in. Could a Christian get so busy with life that Christ is really not all that close to us? Yeah. In the sermonette we heard a while ago, there's a song called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Do we really have that friendship? And I appreciate you giving that message. Do we really have that friendship? It's not just that God is way out there somewhere. Is God with you seven days a week? I don't mean just theologically. I mean, do you, do you feel like he's with you at all times? I mean, you know, my dad, I had a reverential respect. The Bible uses the term fear. You know, if you're a God-fearing, it doesn't mean you're afraid of God. It means you have a reverential respect. I had that from my dad. But I was also friends with my dad. And in the resurrection, I plan to get up with him, and we're going to go out and travel and go out in outer space. He likes to explore things. Well, I plan to do that with him. He and I, I hope, will be buddies for all eternity. Not just father and son, but friends. Do you know you can be a friend of God? Now, some people might say, oh, that's blasphemy. Hold on. What does it say in the book of Isaiah? Abraham was the friend of God. God told Abraham, I'm getting ready to do something, but should I withhold it from you? Yeah, I'm going to tell you what I'll do. I'm going to wipe out Sodom. And because Abraham was a friend of God, he said, well, what if there's ten righteous people there? And God said, well, I won't destroy it if I find ten. But he didn't find ten. He found one. He found Lot. And even though he destroyed the city, he did something that he didn't tell Abraham he was going to do. He took Lot and said, come on out. If you are close to God, you can escape the things that are ahead that's going to come, that's going to hit this country. And I'm not a prophet, and I don't know what's going to happen, and I certainly don't know when. But I, too, I do know one thing. We are under the judgment of God. Uh, Billy uh, went to see this movie. He invited a few of us to go. He bought some tickets, which I appreciate. I guess he won't mind me saying this. And we went to see Jonathan Kahn's movie. And uh, Jonathan Kahn told, said something that I've been saying for many, many years on radio that America is under the judgment of God. You can't kill 
all these millions and millions of innocent people and shed innocent blood and not be under the judgment of God. You know, God allowed Judah to get into all kinds of heathen idolatry. But when Manasseh, the most wicked king, it says he shed much innocent blood. God said, that's it. I'm wiping out Judah. I'm going to wipe it out like a man takes a dish and turns it upside down. You can't do that if you've got food in your plate. The only way, you, if you're at a restaurant, that you can take a dish and turn it upside down if it's totally clean. God said, I'm going to wipe Judah clean. And he did. And even though later on Josiah had the whole nation to repent, God said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because Manasseh shed innocent blood. I'm still going to wipe out Judah. Even though Josiah had repented and the whole nation had repented, God said, it's not enough. You're going to be wiped out. And even if we have a revival, and I sure hope we do in this nation, God will say, what about, what is it now, 63 million children God doesn't just hold the abortionist. It's two every 72 seconds. What is it? Two every 72 seconds. Two children are murdered every 72 seconds. I did see a signboard up here some years ago. I don't know if it's still true. That 4,000 babies are killed every day in America. Legally murdered. You can't tell me that, that these people who think it's okay in the ninth month, and here comes the baby, and the baby's being delivered, and you suck its brains out and murder it on the stop. You can't tell me they don't know that's murder. Of course they do. And God is going to punish this entire nation. The sad thing is you and I live here. When the punishment comes, it's going to hit us. So let's find out what we need to do. And there's two victims every time that happens. Yeah. And sometimes three. And the day. Yeah. Yeah, the victims are not just the baby, the mom. I interviewed a lady on my radio program some years ago. She'd had two abortions, and now she's pro-life. And she talked about how that she didn't get to the hospital. They'd given her the salt solution, what do they call it? Saline solution to burn the baby alive in the womb. And she didn't get to the hospital in time, and she delivered that baby in the backseat of an automobile. And she looked at that little child, and he just had this grimace on his face. And body was all red from burns and that little baby suffered horrible pain and she realized this is what I've done to my own child and now she's pro-life and I interviewed her on the program she said she told me she said Planned Parenthood is nothing but a front for an abortion clinic Revelation 3:20 to Christians he says I'm on the outside if you'll let me and I'll come in sometimes we get so involved in the world we don't have time to have to develop that friendship with God. Now, in chapter 2 and verse 7, to the church, this is what Jesus says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He's talking to the churches. But now, look at the rest of it. Verse 7, chapter 2. To him that overcomes, I'll give to eat of the tree of life, and so on. But to him that overcomes. <coughs> Christians have things to overcome. I'm not going to ask you if you do or not, but... The Bible says that these Christians have things to overcome. In chapter 2 and verse, excuse me, verse uh, 11, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be heard of the second death, but God expects us to overcome. Verse 17, the third line, To him that overcomes, I'll give it eat of the hidden manna. Verse 26, he's writing to Christians, He that overcomes and keeps my works, now we're saved by grace, but after we're saved by grace, we need to start doing the works of God. If he keeps my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Chapter 3, and this is the scariest verse in all the Bible, in my view. Now, for those of you watching over YouTube, if you are a Southern Baptist, turn the volume down. Turn it down. Because this is going to totally contradict what you've been taught. So turn the volume down. You don't want to hear this. Chapter 3 and verse 5. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And if he overcomes, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. If he overcomes. Who is this church? Sardis. The last part of verse 1. I know your works that you have a name. You have a name, but you're a Christian. But you're dead. Christians can become spiritually dead. And if they don't repent... Jesus is standing there like, here's the book of life. He's got an ink blotter. and he's Oh, there's your name right there. 
He's holding this blotter over your name. If you overcome, then he won't blot your name out. Now, what does that imply? Let me give you an illustration. A, a thug comes up to you at nighttime and he puts a gun up to you. He says, if you give me your wallet, I won't pull the trigger. Now, what does that mean? Cost of the thing. What's he getting ready to do? He's getting ready to kill you. If you give me your money, then I won't shoot you. That implies that if you don't, he will. God said, if you repent, if you overcome, then I will not blot your name out of the book of life. Do you know, and this is a sad, sad thing, and it's a scary scripture, that you can get saved, you can get filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you can become converted, and have your name in the book of life, and one day Jesus looks at you, he's your judge. John chapter 5, he's your judge. He could look at you and say, you know what whiteout is, right? He blots it out. That's what in the old days we had to take an eraser and erase what we had typed. Then they invented whiteout. Now you just blot it out. So Jesus had whiteout before they ever invented it down here. And if your name's in the book of life and you're spiritually dead, and he's on the outside knocking, and you don't open that door. You don't let him in. I'm not talking to the sinner. Now, if you're a sinner, yeah, you need to get saved. But I'm talking today to Christians. If you don't open that door and let him in, here's your name right there. There's your name right there. Where's the blotter? Are you going to overcome or not? Your name's coming. This is nothing to play around with. Any more than saying, oh, Russia won't attack us. And brother, I hope you're right. I'm not ready to die. If we will open the door and let Jesus Christ into our life. Now I've heard preachers make fun of the idea of accepting Jesus into your heart. Believe it or not. I used to belong to the church where they made fun of stuff, stuff like that. When I was a teenager. What does it mean to accept him into your heart? You let him into your heart. You can ask any young lady who's engaged. And all she'll bore you to tears talking about how wonderful her fiance is. She will bore you to tears, especially if she's, you know, 18 or 19. He's the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, I know you've told me that 25 times. Oh, he's so wonderful. He's so great. Well, I'm glad she feels that way. But you know what? You know why she does that? Because that man, she's opened up her heart. And she loves him. That's why she talks about him. I've been around Christians that will never talk about Jesus Christ. I've been around churches where Christ, even in the sermon, the last... I, for those of you who are watching, you might know what the initials WCG stands for. For those of you who don't know, I'm not going to name the name of the church. But the last full year I attended that church, I heard two sermons on Jesus. Two in 12 months. And that was when they were getting ready to take communion. And they finally had to mention Jesus. And even then, they didn't mention Him by name. The Christ said this and Christ did this. Almost like they were afraid to mention the name Jesus. Something's wrong with that. You and I can be in the same condition if we're not careful. Where we don't have that close personal relationship. Don't marry somebody that you don't have a close personal relationship with. And so when a girl, all she talks about is this guy she's going to marry. He's the greatest thing since sliced bread. She's opened up her heart to that man. By all means, marry him. But if you don't feel that way, don't marry him. And the church is called the bride of Christ. We are going to one day be in that intimate spiritually and emotional and psychological intimacy that you only have in marriage. And we're going to have that relationship with Jesus. But do you have it now? Do you love Him with all your heart? As a man, it's very hard for me to tell another man I love him. Very hard. Especially when I grew up in a German home where we didn't even tell each other we loved each other. I knew my parents loved me, but they didn't tell me. I didn't, t I didn't tell my mother I loved her. I mean, it just wasn't something we did. And so it's even harder for me to tell Jesus, you know, you're, you're a man. And <clears throat> but, you know, I do love him. And I've learned to be able to say that. You have to open up your heart. We, the collective body of Christ, are the bride of Christ. And we need to open up our heart to Christ and really love him with our heart. And, you know, after a while, it'll be like you and maybe your dad. You became not just father and son or daughter, but you became friends. My father was a friend. I could call him up and say, hey, I need some help. He was there. He was my dad. My heavenly father. I am friends with my heavenly father. What a friend we have in Jesus. And if we have a friend in Jesus, we have a friend with the father, as you pointed out in the sermonette. 
Now, if you, it says you've got to overcome even the Philadelphians. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 12, to the Philadelphians. And he's got nothing bad to say about them, but he says, to him that overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar is a foundational stone. So even Christians who are Philadelphians still have things to overcome, and we know that. Now, it may not be overcoming sin. It might be overcoming other things. Maybe you're overcoming procrastination, laziness. Maybe you're trying to lose weight. You have a lot to overcome. Jesus overcame, not sin, but he overcame temptations. In 1 Corinthians 10, 20, I won't turn there, but it talks about the pagan gods, the demons. What they worship as gods are actually demons. And there was a missionary that went to one of these countries. I forget where it was. I read this years ago. And, the, and he was explaining how you should love God. And he said, you can't love a god. They're fearful. They terrorize us. Because you see, demons engage in mischief against their own worshipers. They said, how can you love a God? But see, the true God is one we're not just to, to worship out of fear, out of terror. They offer sacrifices to appease the wrath of their demons, whom they call gods. 1 Corinthians 10, 20, it says, when they sacrifice to their gods, they're sacrificing to devils. The Greek says demons. But Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, Jesus said, Somebody said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love God. We're to love God. Matthew 6 says, they, the, the disciples said, teach us to pray the way John taught his disciples. Jesus said, okay, pray after this manner. Our Father. Our relationship with, with God is not that he's the great creator God and I'm just an ant. No, he's our dad. He's our heavenly father. And he loves us the way a father is. That's a personal relationship. Now, a lot of people say, well, I haven't read my Bible, and I don't have that personal relationship, but when I retire, I will. And to their credit, a lot of people, when they retire, they get their Bibles out, and they start reading it. Good for them. But what if you don't get the chance to retire? I had an uncle who was in his mid-50s, and they were planning a cruise on what my aunt called the love boat. You know, they were going to have a nice, wonderful cruise, and they had saved up money, and he hadn't been sick a day in his life. But his last day on earth, he was out working in his garden, felt good, felt fine. But he went to bed that night, and he didn't wake up. They think he had a heart attack. You never know. You can't be sure how long you've got. So we need that close relationship. Now, I don't look to you, any of you like I'm old enough to die, right? Nobody thinks I look like I'm old enough to die, right? If you were a student, I'd give you an F if you didn't agree with me. <laughs> <clears throat> but since many of you here are graduates, I can't do that. But last July, I came very, very close to dying. And... Uh, Thankful. You know, here's the thing. If you have a relationship with God, God sometimes looks after you just like a loving father. In fact, Janetta never calls me on a Friday morning. She knows I'm preparing my message. But she said she felt prompted that morning to give me a call. And she said, you don't sound right. And I remember talking to her, but I don't remember much else. The next thing I do, I'm laying on the floor, and she comes running in. She got the key from my brother, and they come both running and screaming my name. And I woke up. I hadn't been unconscious. They called an ambulance. By the time I got to the hospital, my blood pressure had dropped so drastically low that had I not gotten to the hospital then, I mean, it, my high number dropped below 100. It was dropping drastically, and they had to put me on a ventilator. Isn't that right? They put me on a ventilator that very morning. Had that not happened, I wouldn't be stop, standing here talking to you today. I wasn't ready to die last July. This was less than a year ago. I came back close, but I wasn't ready to go. You can look at my house and tell I'm not ready to go. She's been to my house, and I have stuff here and there, and I'm organizing. I'm trying to organize my stuff. i got so much stuff. I'm not ready to die. Now, as a Christian, if I had to die, yeah, I'm ready to meet Jesus. But emotionally, psychologically, i got a lot of things to do before I leave. i got a lot of things I want to do for God. I'm nowhere near ready. But my uncle wasn't either. But ready or not, sometimes question sometimes is asked, would you like to know when you're going to die? Most of us, if I were to do a survey, would say, I don't think I really want to know the exact day I'm going to die. But some people, have, you know, they're told, hey, the hey, sir, you got six months to live. The doctor tells them that. 
that's a tragic thing, but it's also a good thing to know, hey, I got time to prepare. There was a doctor, I went to hear him talk in a Christian businessman's meeting down in East Texas. He was a doctor down in Longview, Texas. And he went to see his physician and they told him what disease he had. They said, you don't have long to live. He said, how long do I have? They said, about three days. Three days. His name was Dr. Whitaker. He was an atheist. He was so mean that he would jerk phones, the cords out of the wall. He was no, not, The nurses hated him. And one young man would come and witness to him. And he was a short little fellow. Dr. Whitaker's a big old tall guy. He's much taller than I am. And this young man would say, Dr. Whitaker, outside of me and Jesus, nobody loves you but your mama. You better get right with God. He said, I told that man, he said, I threatened to kill him if he tells me more about Jesus. But when Dr. Whitaker was on his deathbed, there was only one man he could think of that had ever witnessed him. And these are his exact words. He said, it suddenly dawned on me, I ain't saved. <laughs> so he called on that fella. He got on an airplane, came out there. And that night, he could feel himself dying. He said, I pulled the sheets off the bed, hanging onto the bed for dear life until he could get there to tell me how to get saved. All he had to do was ask for the hospital chaplain, but he didn't know that. He was an atheist. Here's an atheist wanting to get saved, imagine. So the young man comes, he says, Dr. Whitaker, are you now ready? He says, I'm ready. He led him in the sinner's prayer. He said, now I could die in peace. And that fellow said, hey, you know, Jesus not only saves, but he heals. Would you like to be healed? He had childlike faith. He said, sure. And God healed him. And years later, I hear him speak at this Christian businessman's meeting. They told him, you'll be a severe diabetic. You have no pancreas left. But God healed him of that too. He says, I eat anything I want to now. I'm totally healed. And now, the last I heard of him, he's writing Christian books and going around speaking at Christian meetings, letting people know, guess what? There really is a God. But he had three days to prepare. We have to have that close relationship with God. We never know what's going to happen today. Some years ago, when I was living in East Texas, uh, I used to go to a Thursday night prayer meeting, and there was a lady sitting right beside me. We were in a circle. She was eight and a half months pregnant. It's very obvious. She was about 5'2". And so she really looked large. She looked like she was about to have twins. And so she said that week that a purse snatcher came after her and grabbed her purse, and she wouldn't let him have it. She was holding back, so he started. He grabbed her purse and started beating her with her own purse. And she was scared. And she said there were three men standing across the street just standing there watching, didn't offer help. And she said, I better use the name of Jesus. She was a Christian. She said, in the name of Jesus, you run, you flee. He took off and fled in terror. Don't know what he saw. Maybe he saw an angel. She said, last they saw of him, he was still running. <laughs> because you see, she had a relationship with him. Do you have that same relationship? Because if you do, you can be comforted. I want to go to a very familiar psalm, Psalm 23. Very familiar psalm. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And I'm in it with Christ. Psalm 23, one that we all know. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, if you look at right above verse 1, it says it's a psalm of David. I shall not want, that doesn't mean desire, it means lack, be in need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I'm okay. He leads me beside the still waters. Psychologists say if you're all stressed out, go and sit at a lake where it's totally still and it'll calm you down. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now listen to verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe you're in, in a subway up in New York or in some comparable place where there might be some reason to fear. I will fear no evil. Paraphrase. Even if the Russians attack us and send nuclear missiles as they are threatening, I will not fear. For you are with me. You know, I talk to God every day. I go out at night and look up at the stars and I don't plan on praying. I just end up praying. I just end up talking to God. I feel a relationship with God. There are times that God will do little things for me, and I'll look up to heaven and I'll say, that was you, wasn't it? I have that close relationship with God. He's not way out there somewhere, theologically real, but not real to me. He's real to me, and I have that close relationship, and I want you to have it. David was a man after God's own heart, and he said, I will not fear, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. Not that God has a literal stick. But a shepherd has a real, literal stick 
And that stick is not to beat the sheep up, but when the wolves come, you take care of that wolf. You protect your sheep. And so David is using these terms that a shepherd understands. That like a shepherd, what did Jesus say in John 10? I'm the good shepherd. Like a good shepherd, God protects his people. Like a shepherd would protect the sheep. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In other words, it's kind of like <clears throat> if a sheep sees the wolf coming, but you know, if a sheep had the intelligence to understand all this, he sees the shepherd with that staff, the sheep says, oh, he's going to take care of that wolf. I don't have to worry about it. You and I can't do a thing about the Russians, but God can protect you or the Chinese or whoever might come against us. They think now maybe even Iran actually now has actually attained where they actually have the nuclear weapons now. They think possibly that's true. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. I'm running over with blessings. Now listen to verse 6. Surely, not maybe, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. You and I are going to meet David one day. He's going to be in the house of the Lord. Do you have that comfort? Do you do if you have a close relationship? Do you have that comfort? When I was a kid and I had needed help, I called my mother and she'd come out and get me if I was out in the yard. I remember when I was about two and a half, three years old, the dog got after me. He was playing with me. But at the time, I was terrified. That little dog grabbed a hold of my my uh, pants leg and was pulling at my pants like he was playing I know that now but I was absolutely terrorized as a two two and a half three year old kid we moved away from there when I was three so I know I couldn't have been over the three when this happened and I screamed bloody murder and my mother came out there and got that dog off of me my parents were there I knew all I had to do was call out our Heavenly Father is there. Our earthly dads may not be there anymore. And many of you watching online, your earthly dad's not there for you. But your heavenly father's not going anywhere. When my earthly father passed away some years ago, I went out to the tool shed, my father's tool shed, and I was staying there at the workbench, and I looked up at God and I said, well, I know you're not going anywhere. I still got him, and I'll never lose him. What a comfort that is. <clears throat> Do you remember, I won't turn there, but 2 Kings 20, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> God told Hezekiah, get your house in order. You're going to die. <clears throat> Here's a prayer you might want to remember. Hezekiah prayed, Lord, remember how I've walked before you righteously. In a good heart. Remember how I've lived for you. And he cried and he wept. Isaiah told him, you're going to die. Get your house in order. Isaiah walks out. Before he gets to the end of the courtyard, God said, Isaiah, go back and tell him he can live. <laughs> the Russians or the Chinese or somebody may come after us one day. And it may be, hey, you're going to die. Can you honestly say if it happened today, Lord, I have walked before you. I have read your word. I've lived for you. I have a close relationship with you like you were talking about in the sermonette. I have that relationship with you. Remember how I've walked before you. I haven't been perfect, but I've worked on it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep your commandments and your statutes and your judgments. I know your law is not done away. I'm trying to be obedient. I'm supporting your end time work. I'm praying for your end time work. You know, I pray for God's work every day around the world and for this work that we're doing here. Every day of my life, I do that. Can you honestly say to God you've done that? Because if you can, God might say, all right, I'll take care of you. Psalm 91, it, you'll, your enemies will die and perish, but it won't come nigh thee. How about that? Psalm 91 is a beautiful psalm. And then here's a scripture, 2 Kings 1.14. The king had sent these armies with their 50 men, the, the general and his 50 men would come up and, and the old man, come down. King will see you. He says, well, if I am a man of God, let fire come down and destroy you and your 50. And it happened. So the king sent another group. Same thing happened to them. The third general that came out there said, whoa, the same thing's going to happen to me. So he says to Elijah, 
he kneels before Elijah and he says these words, let my, let now my life be precious in your sight. And God, see, he's talking to the man of God. It's like talking to God. And God tells Elijah, don't kill him. Let my life be precious in your sight. When we have a foreign invader that attacks our country, that's a prayer you can pray. Lord, like Hezekiah, remember how I've walked before you? I've lived for you. I've been a part of your end time work. I'm doing what I can do. I don't know what else to do. I'm doing everything I know to do. Remember how I've walked before you. And let my life be precious in your sight. You know they could drop a bomb right here in Charlotte. And for some strange reason, you'd be protected. How? Well, there's where faith comes in. I don't know how God's going to do it. But read Psalm 91. A thousand people die at your left hand. Ten thousand die at your right hand. But it won't hurt you. Think about that. Do we have that kind of relationship? When we stand before God, are we going to be ashamed? I want to read you one more quick scripture. It's in 1 John 2. I'm giving you the references so that you can later maybe look it up and really give this some prayerful thought and meditation. 1 John 2, 28. And now little children, John was in his 90s, and all of the people in the church were like little children to him. Abide in him. That Greek word means remain. Don't slide in and out. You stay in Jesus. That when he shall appear, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Man, I wish I had done this. Oh, man, I didn't was going to be this soon. I wish I had done that. I had planned on doing it, but I never did get around to it. I tried. I meant to read my whole Bible, but I just, I meant to. And I, I started, but I didn't finish. I never got around. I didn't have time. God understands you don't have time. Take the time. God knows you don't have much time. He's only giving you 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week. But take the time to read his word. Take the time to do what Joshua 1 8 says. Meditate in his word. Meditate in it. Think about it. Turn over your mind so that when he does appear, you won't be ashamed. You can have confidence. I've lived for you. I've kept your law. I've kept your... What did Hezekiah say? I've lived before you righteously. Can you do that if Christ came back today or if you died today? We don't know how long we have to live. We just don't know. You know, when I was in the first grade, I met this kid, they called him Butch. Even at that age, I was six and he was five. At that age, he was a terror. All he wanted to do was fight, fight, fight. <clears throat> and, and he died in a car wreck when he was 25 years of age. He was on the front page of our newspaper in a car wreck. I think there was a big sigh of relief in the community. Some years later, and I really think that God worked this out for me to talk to his sister, and I never saw her again after this. I really believe God wanted me to talk to his sister. She knew that I had known him all those years. I knew him quite well. His own father had him arrested, took out a warrant for his arrest. He went to prison for five years. They called him Butch, and he deserved the title. Oh, he, he was the meanest person I've ever met in my life, and and she accidentally, or maybe it was God, saw him walking down the sidewalk one day up here in Kannapolis. She ran into him by accident. She said she affectionately called him Butchie. And she said, Butchie, you need to get right with God. And, and his exact words to her, and I can hear him saying this, I don't have time for God. That's what he said. I don't have time for God. He didn't know he had less than 24 hours to live. And that night, he died. By the time he got to the hospital, they, they called him DOA, dead on arrival. But he didn't have time for God. When are you going to die? Do you have time for God? If you had less than 24 hours a day, what would you do when you went home after church today? Just watch TV? Or would you go over these scriptures? Would you get your Bible out? Would you get on your knees before your Creator and your loving Savior and, and really learn to start loving Jesus and develop a close, personal 
relationship with Jesus. You don't have 24 hours. You've got much longer, I hope. But you've got to drive home today. Is God with you? Do you have that close relationship with God? I never read poetry in a sermon. But I'll make an exception. I will conclude with this. When I was in my 20s, I read this. And I said, I'm going to go out to my storage building and see if I can find that thing. I've kept it all these many years, and I couldn't find it. And it dawned on me. This was such an interesting little short poem that maybe it's on the Internet. Sure enough, it's on the Internet. Now they say it was written in 2010. No, it wasn't. This thing's at least 40 years old. Maybe much older than that. But anyway, and it was anonymous when I read it in my 20s. Now there are various people who are taking credit for it. But I'm going to read it to you. Very short point. In fact, I met a man in Texas who told me he wrote it. I don't know. But anyway, here's the title. It's called No Time to Pray. I'm going to read it to you. And I'll conclude with this. I knelt to pray, but not for long. I had too much to do. Sound familiar? I had to hurry and get to work for bills would soon be due. So I knelt and said a hurried prayer and I jumped up off my knees. My Christian duty was now done. My soul could rest at ease. All day long I had no time to spread a word of cheer. No time to speak of Christ to friends. They'd laugh, they'd laugh at me, I'd fear. No time, no time, too much to do. That was my constant cry. No time to give to souls in need. But at last, the time the time to die. I went before the Lord. I came. I stood with downcast eyes for in His hands God held a book. It was the book of life. God looked into His book and said, Your name I cannot find. I once was going to write it down but never found the time. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. I think every one of you here have accepted Christ. I don't know about all the people watching online. If you haven't, accept Christ as your Lord and Savior and start living for Him. And have your name written in the book of life. For those of us who are Christians, and we have our name in the book of life, do we have that close personal friendship? What a friend we have in Him. Do we have that friendship? Do we have that that day-by-day day communion with God where we know He's with us when we drive down the road. We know He's with us wherever we go. And we have that feeling. We just know He's there. Do we have any questions online? Um, just a few comments. Okay. People saying that we need to get our house in order and yeah. you know, how much they've been encouraged by this message. Good. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. I can read two verses. Okay. About being a friend. John 15, 14, and 15. It says, Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command. You're my friend if you do whatever I command you. Okay, that's, that's knowing how to be. Knowing how to be his friend. Yes. Good point. And henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant know not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. Meaning he's already told us in his word what to do. He's told us how to live, and if we'll do it, then he will consider us his friends. Yes, Abraham lived for God. Genesis 26, 5, it says, Abraham kept my laws. He was a friend of God. Are you keeping God's laws, or have you been deceived and thinking, I don't have to do anything? For salvation, you're under grace, but after that, how do you live? Thank you for sharing that. Any other comments or thoughts? Well, I don't want to hold you over time. Thank you for being here today, all of you. Good crowd. Uh, for those of you, I want to welcome our international audience, who, all of you who are watching. Share your comments and thoughts and tell other people where they can watch these videos. God bless you. Uh, be with us again next week. I think we'll have our singers back next week, so we'll have some music. If they're watching on Facebook and they want to share this with anybody that doesn't have Facebook, they can let them know that it's live streamed on our Christian Fellowship Ministry YouTube channel. Yeah, if you didn't hear that, our Christian Fellowship Ministries YouTube channel, you can share this message with them. It's the same world avatar on YouTube so, that we have on Facebook. It's a picture of the world, a picture of the earth. That's our, our symbol. So, Because you know, there's several groups using our name, Christian Fellowship Ministries. Be, to, be blessed. We're dismissed. Have a great week. Good to see I didn't say welcome to our visitors. 
Glad you're here today, sir. Good to have you two with us too. Take care. Be blessed.